Good morning. Nice to see everybody here this morning. If you're on the back, come on in. We're going to go ahead and start our praise and worship this morning. Let's all stand. We're going to sing, As Long As I Have You. <coughs> going to continue this morning with Forever Rain.
times I'll, I'll pray that God's light can shine through me and that the love of God and the love of Christ can shine through me and but then I, I get really down on myself and I'll get really really insecure because obviously I'm not perfect nobody else here is too but a lot of times we're just really far from perfect and a lot of times I'll mess up and a lot of times it's like you feel like you're not shining that light that you want to shine and for me, a lot of these praise songs are just so encouraging. Like for her, when it says, you are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sins. Even those times when we think that, wow, we're really messing things up and we're really not worthy of showing God's love. If we keep coming back to God, if we keep believing and trusting in Christ, then that light is already in us, and that light's going to keep on shining. And I just love it, just the, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, and just trusting God's embrace as his love for us and the salvation that he gives us, and just to be there always for that light that's going to shine through us, even when we're kind of getting in the way of it. Um, the next song says, He is my refuge and my strength always. I will not fear. His promise is true. My God will come through always. Let's take a moment as we prepare to continue to worship. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for loving me even though I'm so imperfect, God. And I, and I know a lot of us, probably all of us in here have this desire to have your light shine through us, God, and then we struggle with our imperfections, God. And I just thank you that when we were saved, that the Holy Spirit came into us, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and the Holy Spirit is in us at all times, God. So I thank you that we can just trust you, that you are with us always, God. I pray as we continue to worship this morning, God, that we could just lift our whole heart and just love you as you deserve to be loved. Thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning. Good to see all your happy, smiling faces with my nearsightedness. Um, as you know, we're in this time of year in which we uh, promote the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, for those of you who have been here for a while, you know that that's something that we do routinely every year. And it's, despite the fact that it is a long-standing tradition, nevertheless, remains one of the main ways in which the North American Mission Board is employed in making sure that we can reach people with a gospel whom you and I will never have the opportunity to meet. Um, and so we're going to take a couple of minutes and watch a video that gives you a little bit more information and textures what it is that the North American Mission Board does through the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. I was raised in a Christian home, but I gave my parents a really hard time. And so I finally decided to join the military because I wanted to do something hard and actually finish it. And it was actually towards the end of my military service when I gave my life to Christ. And having spent time in the army, I know uh, that it can be a really spiritually dark place. They're young, they're far from family for the first time. They don't have maybe a lot of good influences. A lot of broken homes, marriage is struggling, addiction, a desperate need for the gospel. There's a lot of young Marines here and they're living in the barracks. When we started this church, we knew that that was an area that God was calling us to reach, to host Marines for a Marine dinner once a month is where it started. To have something like a dinner that they can come to and just be themselves and sit on a couch and eat a warm meal is really impactful for them. More and more guys started coming and we baptized our first Marine last summer. And then that Marine led to another Marine and then another one to the point now where every week we're seeing fruit. This church like means business. Uh, they don't, they are not okay with you just punching your church card every week. <laughs> it was obvious that this was a church that was doing church like the Bible says we should do church. I feel encouraged every time I go to church, like I wish every day was Sunday. When people give to Annie Armstrong, it enables churches like ours to reach military members and their families with the gospel. Washington, D.C. is a city with many, many nations. So to have a gospel-centered, healthy church here is reaching not only the people in this city, but cities all across the world. The military is already moving people around and as they are moved from place to place they can take the gospel with them it's exactly what Jesus has called us to do and God is changing people's lives amen so as we uh, as we continue to collect the inner Armstrong Easter offering and let you know that hundred percent of what you give towards that missions offering goes to the North American Mission Board none of it is retained here and so we just encourage you to continue to pray how God may uh, ask you to serve in that way. A couple of other announcements here as we get going. Of course, today we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Table. For those of you who may be uh, joining us, our policy at Baptist Fellowship is if you've come to that place in which you've trusted Christ, uh, we encourage you to celebrate the Lord's Table with us this morning. Um, you don't have to be a member. Um, <clears throat> we encourage you to join with us as part of God's family. Also, a few upcoming things on April 5th, there'll be a ladies' breakfast at Blondie's. On April 9th, the guys are going to see if there's anything left, and we're going to come at April, we're going to the men's breakfast at, night, at uh, Blondie's at 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, on the 10th, there'll be a monthly church prayer service at Faithway Community at 6 p.m. We encourage you just to come to that and uh, join other churches as we gather together as people in New England lifting up the gospel. Um, on April 15th, we will have a Good Friday service here at 7 p.m., and I really encourage you to attend. Um, Ruthie Richardson is going to share her testimony and bring some music to us, and there'll be a short sermon. Uh, but it really is an opportunity for us just to be reminded of what God can do in the life of individuals, and most importantly, um, what the cross represents to us as people. And then here on April 17th, we will have Easter at Baptist Fellowship Church. Um, 9.30 a.m. we will have breakfast. Uh, thank you to um, some of the folks in our congregation here who put that together. Um, obviously, Carol, and, uh, and then I think <clears throat> also Michelle um, is helping. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate all of your work. And, uh, and, and Dennis, is that you cooking too? Good. That's good. Is Bruce cooking? No. Bruce is not cooking? Okay. You, you don't have to double up on the crest door. <laughs> have you ever had Bruce's monkey bread? 
They, they should actually come with an FDA warning. It is so good. All right, well, I'm monkey bread at the women's brunch, so only women, that's right. Uh, and the Pollyannas will be meeting at uh, 10 a.m. in Grace Cafe on the 21st, and on Mother's Day brunch, which is what Michelle's talking about, that'll be 9 a.m. in Cooper Fellowship Hall. And then on the 7th, uh, we'll have a family fishing day at 10 a.m. at Mansfield Hollow Dam. So uh, grab somebody that you love, grab a fishing pole, and maybe invite somebody. And that'll be a great opportunity to share Christ with others. All right, let's go, oh, go before the Lord um, and ask a oh, last announcement. Um, Matt wanted me to let you know that there is going to be a choir practice 5.30 or 5, Matt? 5 o'clock. Uh, for anyone who wants to come here, uh, just to gather together and to prepare uh, for a choir at the Easter service. And then last but not least, uh, Dennis, um, a couple of weeks ago, passed out some information on prayer triplets and how we can get together with two other couples or two other people in order to hold up our congregation in prayer and invite people to uh, Easter. And so I, if you haven't done that, would you consider doing that? Find a couple other people or a couple other couples and just gather together in prayer. If you need to do it in person, that'd be great. If you have to do it by the phone, that's fine too. But hold somebody up in prayer that you might be willing to witness to and invite uh, during this Easter season. And speaking of prayer, let's go before the Lord. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for the blessings that you have poured out among us. And Lord God, I pray that you will help us as we spend some time together here lifting up your holy name. Uh, Lord God, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, God, I just pray uh, that you will speak to us, that you will help us to let go of those things in our life that create barriers between you and us. And Father, that you would give us the ability with open hands to reach out to you and to reach up to you and to grab a hold of the grace that you continually pour into our lives and into our hearts through the gospel of your son. Father, I pray that you would be with members of our congregation who are grieving or ailing. And Father, I pray that you will lift them up. Lord God, I do pray for Cindy and for James, Lord. I pray that you'd be with her as she recovers from surgery. Lord God, just draw close to her and help her through these next few uh, weeks and months as she begins this next journey towards a, a new normal in her life. Lord God, I pray that you be with my brother Bruce as he mourns the loss of his brother. And um, Father, just draw close to him. Help him during this time. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll be with Chiro as he uh, prepares to have a stent um, placed in his heart. Uh, Father, give him the strength to be able to have that surgery, and Lord, I pray that you guide his doctors through that surgical procedure. And I pray for many who can't join us here on Sundays simply because of health reasons. Uh, Father, those who maybe uh, just have a cold, God, I pray that you be with them, but also those who are really struggling um, with their health. I think of uh, my brother, George Carroll. Be with him as he continues to heal. Uh, Lord God, just place your healing hand upon him. Father, I always thank you and praise you for, uh, uh, God, for um, uh, Selma Henning. Lord, just be with her, uh, Father. <coughs> Pardon me, as she, as she uh, would love to be here but can't make it. And so, Father, will you help our congregation just to, to rally around her and to minister to her? And, Lord, I pray that you be with Neil and Gail Christopher, Father, and uh, help him to continue uh, to seek medical treatment for his pain, Lord, and just lift him up. Father, I pray that you be with us as we approach this Easter season. Uh, Lord God, would you place upon our hearts uh, someone who we can reach out to for the, the sake of Christ? Maybe we be the kind of church, Lord, that takes very seriously the great commission that you've given us to go make disciples of all nations. And Father in heaven, Lord, we just pray that you will help us in this season uh, to take the precious truths of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your Son and hold them in our hearts in such a way that we are closer to them now than we have been in the past. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing on in our sermon series on the words and the work of Jesus Christ. And we are going to be moving towards our understanding of what the cross is and the crucifixion of Jesus uh, last week, Dennis brought you a sermon on the crucifixion of Jesus and what it means, and we're going to continue in, in that sense until we get to Easter, in which case our 
Focus, obviously, will shift the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's a great deal in Christianity that focuses on the cross. And it's very important that as God's people that we understand the importance of the cross because there are many denominations, or at least a few, that have constructed a theology of the cross uh, that is inappropriate, that does not allow for the cross to represent the fullness of what it is and the finality of what it is. To give you a little illustration of uh, that confusion in our culture, there was a time a few years ago in which I was uh, witnessing to some people. It was during a week in which I happened to have an opportunity to witness to two ladies. One of them had questions about the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and about the righteousness of God, the justice of God. Some of the questions really weren't about the cross at all. It was about the nature and character of God. And she was telling me how she had a hard time believing in organized religion or church or denominationalism or anything else that had to do with God. She was open to the idea of spirituality. Uh, she was willing to consider the possibility that Jesus was an actual person who walked the earth. Uh, but some of the questions that she just had generally about religion and God was how can God tolerate all the evil in the world? It is what's known in philosophical circles as the problem of evil. If there is a loving and just God, why is there so much evil in the world? And at that time, there was highlighted in the news some issues of human trafficking. And she wanted to know how God, who is loving and kind and just, could not be just so angry at that that he would have snuffed out their lives or prevented from any of that from happening. How can a God who is just deal with some people who are just absolutely heinous sinners. How can God do that? Interestingly enough, in that same week, I had an opportunity to talk to another woman, and her response was that she didn't believe in the God of Christianity because she wanted to understand God purely as love and mercy, that she didn't believe that God could punish anyone. How could a God who is loving send anyone to hell? Why is there a God that we believe in that would ever enact punishment on anyone? And I found it ironic that on one, at the beginning of the week, I had someone who wanted to know why God was not more judgmental. And by the end of the week, I had another person who was rejecting God because he was too judgmental. And it seemed to me that it illustrated something about our human nature, about the way that we interact with both the justice and the mercy of God that is really not very objective, uh, often very self-focused, and, and really presents a double standard that no divine being could ever live up to, which is that we want a God who is just when we think he ought to be just. Does that make sense? We want God's justice when God's justice seems right to us. And so we look at certain things in the world and we say, that's wrong and God should do something about it. But we also want a God who is merciful when we want him to be merciful. We want people that we like to receive the mercy of God. We want ourselves and others to experience and to be able to bathe in God's mercy. But we want the people that we don't like and the people that we're angry with to experience God's judgment and wrath. And it seems to me it has everything to do with our proximity, the people who are like us, the people who are around us. It has a lot to do with our affinity, the people who we care about and that we want to experience God's mercy. And it has a lot to do with our fickle understandings and attitude about how the world ought to run. In essence, we want God to be and to do like we would be and do were we the one who are running the universe. It seems to me that's just a little too convenient and self-focused. But it does bring up an, an interesting question, doesn't it? How do we, as Christians, understand both the righteousness of God and his mercy? Because in some way it seems as if those two things come crossways to each other, that they eventually intersect. It's sort of like that math problem that, that troubled you in, in, uh, in grade school. You know the one that talked about one train going one direction at so many miles per hour and another train coming in exactly the opposite direction going at so many miles per hour. And you know what the only good answer to that question is? Stop doing math. Get off the train. We're on a collision course. 
right? You don't want to find out what happens when that happens, when those two trains come barreling towards each other at whatever speed they're barreling towards each other. Stop doing the math. Just get off the train. Poor Bill's over there agape because he's a math teacher. He wants to know <laughs> how someone in a position as responsible and I could say something so irresponsible as don't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> it's important for somebody to know the answer. It's important for everyone else to get off the train. <laughs> but it is, it does illustrate something about, about God. It seems to me and many and to a lot of people that God's justice and God's mercy are on collision courses. That they're both going in different directions. And how can God reconcile both of those things? And the answer, I believe, is in the cross of Christ. That in the cross of Christ, God's justice and his mercy finally meet in the most elegant and loving solution that God could have ever devised for the salvation of human souls. But it requires us to make a few, come to a few conclusions. It requires us to believe a few things that maybe we are reluctant to believe in, in our own flesh. And the first one is that God does have wrath, and God's wrath is just. And to introduce that concept, I'd like to take us to the first chapter of the book of Romans in the 18th verse. So if you'll turn with me to Romans 1.18, we will begin our journey through God's word in this verse. As you continue to turn, consider that Paul's epistle to the Romans is perhaps the one that is the most filled with his understanding of the gospel and his revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how atonement actually works. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we read this. This is the word of the Lord. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creator, creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. There, there are a number of things in this particular verse that can catch our attention. The first one, of course, is the opening line that Paul gives as he introduces this section of scriptures. He wants the Romans to understand that the righteous shall live by faith. He begins with an understanding of God that is probably more palatable to them than it is to us because in our culture, it is unpopular to think of God as being angry or God as being wrathful. The reality of the matter is that for many people, we see God either as grandpa, the person who never got angry, or sort of as Jesus, the, the, the driver of the, the, Volkswagen, the VW bus, you know, the one that's, that's painted tie-dye and who is constantly passing out flowers. We sort of see that as who God is. We don't see a God who is capable of having just wrath. But the Bible tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that's an important phrase because it doesn't just say some ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It says all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, which means that it's not just those people's unrighteousness, the ones that we look at and we cluck our tongues or we tisk at when we see them doing those terrible things. It's all of our unrighteousness, even the unrighteousness that comes very close to home, even the ones that we see within our own hearts. 
Paul will later on tell us that none is righteous, no, not one. And so when God talks about the wrath, his own wrath, when he reveals it to us through the Apostle Paul, telling us that his wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, he's not just talking about those people over there, he's talking about this guy right here. God's wrath is poured out because of sin, and not just their sin, but our sin, my sin. And he says that that manifests itself in a number of ways. The first way that it manifests itself is through the suppression of truth. In verse 21 it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. If you want to know how that happens, it comes all the way back to verse 19 when the Bible says that what can be known about God is plain to everyone because God has shown it to them. And if you want to know how it is that a person who does not honor God and back it up and understand that the reason that they don't honor God is because they don't recognize God. And if you want to know the question as to why it is that they don't recognize God, all you have to do is go to a couple verses back where it says that the reason that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness is because men in their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. Sometimes it's helpful to look at the equation from the answer backwards. And the answer backwards is, we know and we see very clearly that there are people who do not honor God. And we understand that the reason that they don't honor God is because they don't recognize God in their midst. They can't see the very evidence of God that they walk around appreciating all the time. And the reason that they can't see the handiwork of God in creation, according to the Bible, is because people were born with this innate ability and penchant to suppressing the truth. And unrighteousness. And what that means essentially, uh, the Greek word is that they push it down. That we have taken the truth of God. The very natural inquisitiveness that we have when we perceive the universe and the world around us and we look outside and we get to see the, the beauty of a sunset or the intricacy of the seasons or the order to the universe or the elegance of things like mathematics. The fact that gravity works the same way yesterday and today, and we anticipate that it will tomorrow. That there's so much that we can study about the universe and the world around us, and even our own bodies, that betray the fact that there is a divine, orderly creator who made it work in such a way that it is very elegant and intricate and works. If you've ever seen any science shows, I can't believe anybody would ever watch an episode of Nova and not come away thinking there has to have been an incredible intelligence behind and above all of this. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, just to think that it all happened by accident and that it all works together in such a way that we just continue to walk around oblivious to just how tentative life on this planet actually is. The fact that the moon is as close to the earth as it is so, so that it creates tides, which are essential to the functioning of the ocean currents, which oxygenate the ocean so that plant life can live in the ocean, which feeds the smaller things, which feed the bigger things, which are inherent to the hydrological cycle that keeps the clouds, you know, producing and giving rain, which allows our farmers to grow things like corn, which allows them to produce what it is that you're about to go eat for lunch. Did you see how intricate it all is? Were it not for the moon, you wouldn't get lunch. And if it were any farther away, the tides would be off. And if it were any closer, the tides would be too violent. And we all just sort of assume, well, that's a happy little accident. But that's not an accident, and it's not the only one. Which is why the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God's. Which is why Romans tells us 
that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Everything around us testifies to the fact that there is an orderly mind, a divine mind that has created and sustains everything around us. And yet in humanity, they, it's easiest for us to think of them doing it, suppress the truth, push it down, keep it at bay. I don't want to hear it. And they do it in unrighteousness. Have you ever tried to witness to someone and they just simply don't want to hear it? They just don't want to hear it. Yeah, that's evidence of the fact that that's exactly what they're doing. They're taking the truth and they're pushing it away. They're suppressing it. They're pushing it down because they don't want to hear it. Because if they heard it, they'd have to deal with it. But the Bible says they're not the only ones who do it. And the Bible says that we have done it. We are just as guilty. At least prior to coming to that moment in time in which we gave our lives over to the truth of the gospel, we also were those who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And the outcome is that we have all together become futile in our thinking. Our futility is a choice. It's an exchange. And that exchange is to exchange the glory of God for worshiping other things, whether they be resemblances of mortal man or birds and animals and creeping things. But even for those of us who have graduated on in human society and we no longer idolize things that we carve with our hands, yet even within our hearts we find that there are times in which things creep in that become much more important to us than our devotion and our love for God. John Calvin described the human heart as an idle factory, as something that continuously is drawn away from our affection for God and we become more affectionate for things in our lives. We have all together become idolaters. And God is justly wrathful at us for it. Well, that doesn't sound like very good news. And so in the cross, God in his infinite and in his mercy devised a solution which we find in Romans chapter 5, starting in the 6th verse. Now, we've sort of done a flyby on this passage in the past, but we're going to walk through it a little bit more in detail today. In Romans chapter 5, starting in the 6th verse, we read this from the Apostle Paul. For while we were weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him, from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Uh, Paul makes in the observation and the admission that while we were still weak, Jesus did this. Jesus didn't go to the cross for a group of people who were supporting him and lifting him up, who were rightly standing with him. The Bible says that while we were still weak, at that right time, Christ died for us who were ungodly. God showing his love for us and that while we were still sinners, still engaged in the suppression of righteousness, Christ died for us. And then he says this in the conclusion to that analysis. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, much more shall we be saved by him from what? What are we saved from? The wrath of God. Our salvation, according to Romans chapter 5, is at least in part a salvation of the just wrath of God. It is every bit about God's wrath meeting his mercy. 
The, the, the theological concept that I'm really hinting at here is called substitutionary atonement. And the idea is that Jesus took the cross that I deserved. That the wrath of God was fully and finally poured out upon Jesus Christ in order that he might absorb the fullness of the righteous wrath of God in my place for me so that I would not have to. And it is, it is reflected in passages like 2 Corinthians 5.21, which I've talked about in the past, that says, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That concept of Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, who knew no sin, nevertheless took our sins upon himself to the point that God treated him as sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. There's a passage in the Old Testament that foretells that and helps us to understand it very beautifully. It's in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53 says this, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows, sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This precious prediction of the cross of Jesus Christ, and honestly, I can't think of any other way to, to understand that passage. Uh, frankly, one of the things that I have done in the past to witness to people, specifically uh, those who are my Jewish neighbors and people within my own family, is to take them to Isaiah 53 and ask them what testament they think it's really in. And many of them will say, well, that has to be a New Testament passage. Clearly, that's talking about what you Christians believe about Jesus Christ. And that's when I get to pull the whole rug out from underneath them. And nope, nope, that's yours. You own that one. That's Isaiah. That one was long before Jesus was ever born. It describes very clearly the crucifixion of Jesus. But even beyond that ability to show people that even as far back as the book of Isaiah in antiquity, God had predicted the cross, the significance and the theology of the cross bleeds through that in such a way that it just, just impacts our heart. That Jesus was the one who was despised and rejected by men. That he bore our griefs, that he carried our sorrows. That he was smitten by God. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, he was his chast chastisement is that which brought us peace. And that last verse is one that I think that would be good for all of us to memorize as we maybe consider witnessing to others. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, the cross is about the wrath of God, but it is also about the mercy of God. Jesus willingly went to the cross to absorb the wrath of God so that we might become the objects of his mercy. Which is why the cross is our ultimate hope of reconciliation. So if you turn with me to the book of Colossians, the first chapter... That's the last bit of flipping around I'll ask you to do. 
get some Bible calisthenics here. We get everybody's fingers work out, worked out. That's right. Let your fingers do the walking. I think that was about phone books, wasn't it? <laughs> they don't do phone books anymore. That's right. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to start on the 15th verse. Now, in my opinion, this passage just absolutely paints a picture of the humbleness and humility of Jesus Christ that that if, if it doesn't touch you, then you're either not hearing well or there's your heart has been has become calloused. It it describes really the history of who Jesus is and what he did and why he came. It really is one of those stories that talk about a person who is willing to endure the worst, having come from the most glorious. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God. Now, I just want you to think about that for a second. Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man, the one who was born in the manger on that first Christmas morning, the one who had previously before enjoyed the accolades of angels, came to this earth, joined himself with human nature and became the image of the invisible God, the very firstborn of all creation. So that when anyone looked at Jesus, they, even though could not necessarily recognize it, were seeing the closest image of God that anyone had ever seen. There have been artists throughout the years who have attempted to try and paint the image and the glory of God in such a way that it sort of helps our understanding and our imagination to appreciate his majesty. One is, of course, the painting on the top of the Sistine Chapel. And, and if you, I imagine if you were to, I've never seen, I've only seen pictures, but I imagine if you had the opportunity to tour and you were to look up, you would have said it, it just how amazing and how much artistry and how much work went into trying to give an artistic representation of the glory of God. And yet how ironic it was that Jesus, as he walked to this earth, the one who in the Bible says was had no form that we would appreciate his majesty, the image of the very invisible God no one recognized unless it was revealed to them. And then it begins to, to build a resume for who Jesus is. It says in verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rules or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Everything was created with Jesus in mind. Everything was done in order to bring glory to him. And he is before all things, and all thing, in him all things hold together. He's the only thing keeping this, this together, all of it. I mean, it really is humbling to realize that the only reason that the earth, can, the earth continues to hold together the way that it does is because Jesus wills it to. The only reason that I'm given the next breath is because Jesus wills it. The only reason that I am given another heartbeat is because the Son of God allows it and wills it to happen. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the one that we see as the leader of our religion. He's the one in charge of all of this thing in the church. Incidentally, as a pastor, it is really important that I remember that all the time. Jesus is the one in charge of this place. It's his agenda that we should be pursuing. My job is just a stewardship. Like the dad handing the kid the car. 
And he expects it back in pretty good condition. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So that when he looks at Philip, he can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The fullness of God, every attribute of God, every glory of God, every part of God's character and purpose dwelt in the person of Jesus Christ. And through whom and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So, so let's just stop here just for a second. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity that we worship. The Bible says he made all things. He's the creator. He's a sustainer. Everything holds together because of him and through him. Everything was made for him. If, if, if angels were having a conversation in heaven, why did God do that? Well, because of Jesus. Because of the Son of God. He is the one we made this for. For his glory, for his enjoyment. For lifting him up. He's the one through whom everything was created. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased. To dwell on earth, Jesus walking around was the fullness of God. There was no part of God, of his God's character, of his essence, of his being, that was not fully represented by Jesus Christ when he was walking around here on this earth. And then in verse 20 it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The fullness of God willingly took a cross and shed his blood in order to make peace with us. Verse 21, and you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, thinking the wrong things about God, doing evil deeds, disobeying God, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and fest, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which he has proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke everything in existence, and everything in heaven and on earth existed not only because of him, but for him. If you were to walk around in heaven, he could say, that's mine, I made it. That's mine, I made it. That's mine, I made it. And if he watched his creation fall and rebel against him, which ought to make him angry, but instead of pouring out his wrath on the objects of those who had actually committed the transgression, the second person of the Trinity willingly stepped into human form, allowed the fullness of the wholeness of God to dwell in his body, and willingly took upon himself a Roman cross, allowing his blood to be spilt in order that he might make peace with this creation who was hostile in mind and doing evil deeds. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And yet we in our culture have done so much to the cross to make it trivial and silly. We put crosses on tattoos. 
We put them around our necks as if they're simply jewelry. And I don't want to be judgmental if you've got a tattoo of a cross or if you have a, something that is precious to you that reminds you of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I think that's totally fine. But the reality of the matter is I've seen people wearing crosses and owning crosses who didn't know Jesus from anyone. We've taken the precious message of the cross and what happened on that bloody instrument of death and the price that was paid in order that you and I might have peace with God and we have done exactly what the devil has asked us to do with it and we have trivialized it and we've made it nothing and we've made it little more than a decoration or a piece of jewelry or something that we can be creatively interpretive with an artwork and we have robbed it of its essence and of its power and of its message so that when we look at it, our hearts no longer break or overflow with thankfulness. And my hope for you this Easter season is that we would once again fall in love with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God was righteously angry for what we had done. And instead of pouring out his wrath upon us, his son willingly took a cross and absorbed the fullness of that anger and of that wrath that we may only experience God's mercy. If we would come to him. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's table. Because it is a reminder to us of what Jesus has done. It's a reminder of God's mercy and his justice meeting together in such a way that we no longer have to see ourselves as strangers and aliens, those in hostile in mind and evil in works, but those who have been fully and finally reconciled to God, knowing only peace. Knowing only peace. And here's why I think that this is so important. Because it's a continual reminder of what is already accomplished and done. Your sins have been dealt with. It's over. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God has taken your sins as far as the east is from the West and has separated you from your sin and your iniquity because the precious Lamb of God has taken our punishment for us. All we like sheep have gone astray and God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Freeing us to experience that peace with God. As we take the Lord's Supper, would you just be reminded of the peace that you experience with God? And some people may say, well, I don't feel very peaceful. Well, consider this. I don't imagine that Jesus on the cross felt very peaceful. And yet the very work that he was engaged in was the work that was bringing us peace. Peace. It's important, I think, sometimes, especially when, when in our culture, for us to allow our feelings to follow our thoughts rather than allow our thoughts to inform our feelings. Or rather, our feelings to inform our thoughts. Does that make sense? I think I said that in reverse. I think it's important for us as Christians to allow our thoughts to inform our feelings rather than allow our feelings to dictate our thoughts. Does that make sense? And so it's likely for you to wake up some moments and feel like, I just feel far from God. Well, now it's time for us to rehearse the truth. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, can, nor anything can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Remember those Bible verses? When he says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you.
when Jesus says, and I will lose none of those that the Father will give to me. Just because you don't feel close to God doesn't mean that God isn't close to you. I, I can imagine, it's, I can remember a time in which my son was walking with me and, and we were in the park and, and I was right behind him the whole way, but he couldn't see me. He was too distracted by everything else that was going on around him. Years and years and years ago when he was a little toddler, right? And at one point in time, he turns around, he starts crying. He's like, Dad, where are you? I was right behind him. Right, within, I could literally reach out and grab him by the nip of his neck if I needed to. I was right there. But he didn't feel like Dad was near. Yeah, well, this reminds us that our Father is near to us at all times. That our brother and our Savior will never leave us nor forsake us. That the brokenness of his body allowed us to be made whole. And so as we take of the supper, can we remember that truth? Can I invite the elders to come forward and the worship team to come up as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's table? On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he broke it, he said, This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me.
Father in heaven, we are grateful for that precious truth, Lord, that you genuinely and fully rested and dwelt in the person of Jesus Christ, that the leader of our church, the one whom we celebrate here this morning, um, is the one who gives us life and sustains us. So together can we sing the chorus of that a cappella before we take communion. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the After dinner, Jesus took the cup, and when he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me.
Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, which takes away our every sin, which removes our every iniquity, that takes away our every sorrow and transgression. Our world is a world that is steeped in sorrow and transgression and anxiety. And the one thing that they are all clamoring for is a sense of peace. And we have it through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so will you for just a minute just breathe deeply and allow the peace that that cross brings you to wash over you. And have experienced that peace afresh. Just say, thank you, God, for Jesus. Let's celebrate together. And now, according to our great tradition, let's lift up our voices and sing Amazing Grace. Live to give to the ongoing work of Baptist Fellowship. There's a box in the back. Father in heaven, I thank you for these people. Lord God, they are your people, for you purchased them by the blood of your Son. Father, may that power course through their veins this week. Lord God, when they are tempted to believe that you have abandoned them, may they be reminded that you are with them with every step. When the devil comes to accuse them, may they stand in your forgiveness, for the perfect blood of Jesus has washed away their sin. And Lord God, when they are tempted to believe that they can fail because of their iniquities, may they be reminded, Lord God, that you and your Son have reconciled them to you that they have your peace. And Lord God, if, they're, if you are in them, Lord God, if the Lord Jesus Christ is for them, then nothing can stand against them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week. Lord bless you.